So John, I wanted to ask you some questions uh, to get some clarity on the issues around trade agreements and public services. So what exactly are we talking about when we talk about these services? Well services are basically any job that somebody does for you, let's say plumbing or someone gives you a haircut, but in economic terms it refers to anything up to 160 sectors which can be financial services, tourism, health services, education, a whole range of services like that. The traditional way of describing it is that services are anything you can't drop on your foot. So it makes it different from coffee, beans, bananas, steel. How did trade deals come to be about services? Originally, trade negotiations were all about trade in goods. So it was about cutting tariff barriers for the export and import of goods, whether it be coffee, beans, steel, whatever it could be. Um, and then in the Uruguay round of trade talks, which took place between 1986 and 94, the big financial services lobby introduced the idea of trade in services. So that's where they first came into the world of trade negotiations. What does trade in services mean? One of the problems they had when they first introduced the concept of trade in services is that it's much more difficult to conceptualise than, let's say, trade in goods. Let's say somebody grows rice in Thailand and exports it so it's consumed in Britain. It's clear how the trade takes place. So what they did is they came up with four modes of services supply. The first mode, mode one, is the one most akin to goods trade. So you have somebody who will produce the service in one country, you consume it in another. Let's say, for example, I phone up an IT helpline in India asking for help to get my computer working. The person's sitting in India, I'm sitting in Britain, and so it's a cross-border supply. Mode two, the second mode of services, is when the consumer moves abroad, consumption abroad. So let's say I travel to South Africa to have a cataract operation. The service is being given to me by a foreign provider in South Africa, but I have actually moved to have that service. Mode three is the other way around, that a foreign service provider will come and set up a commercial presence in my country to be able to deliver the service here. So let's say a, a South African clinic sets up in London and they provide a service to me here. That's mode three, a commercial presence. And mode four is the movement of natural persons so that they have a presence. This is where you have, for example, a doctor who will come for a short while or an architect who will be brought in by their firm to do a particular temporary job and then they go back to their own country. So there's four modes of services which makes it a bit more complicated. How do trade negotiations work when it comes to services? One country will offer up certain sectors to be liberalised and the other country will say we want to have more, we want to open up more markets. And you write down the different sectors and subsectors that you're prepared to offer in a schedule of commitments. And these commitments are made on paper and then can be seen by the other side. And what do these schedules look like? The schedules are broken down into two main columns. The first column is a column which is called limitations on market access. And that describes which sectors and subsectors you've opened up for liberalisation and whether or not you've put any terms and conditions on them. The second column is limitations on national treatment. And that's how the corporations will be treated once they've already come in to your markets. What does it mean to make a commitment? Making a commitment in trade negotiations is about binding them. So you could, for example, have already experimented with water privatisation and you can then, if it's been a disaster, take water back into public hands. Once you've put it into a trade agreement, it's effectively irreversible. So the idea of making a binding commitment is what trade agreements are all about. It's saying to foreign companies, you have guaranteed access for the future and we won't take stuff back into public hands and we won't close the markets down. How can you read a schedule? To read a schedule, you just need to work through the different elements in it. So, for example, on this page, we're looking here at the European Union's offer in the Trade in Services Agreement and we're looking at the health services and social services sector you'll see that you have, first of all, the different modes. So you have one, two, three, with the bracket after them. And then you have, under each of them, 
what level of access you're looking at. So here on the left hand column, we've got limitations on market access. In mode one in the health services, it says EU, except in Hungary, unbound. Unbound means that they haven't been given up for liberalization. But the next bit it says, in Hungary, none. And when it says none, it means there's no limitation on the level of liberalization. On the next line it says two, that means mode two, consumption abroad, EU none. That means there are no limitations on the level of liberalization. It's fully open, except for ambulance services, which means that that particular subsector has been carved out of that commitment. What does it mean to talk about limitations? A country can enter either a horizontal limitation, which means for across the whole range of services sectors, they're excluding a particular bit, or they can do sector by sector limitations, which say, yes, we'll open up most of our sectors, but we want to preserve this one from the type of binding commitment we've made in other sectors. And what is the difference between positive and negative listings? When people first introduced the concept of trade in services, it was in the Uruguay round through the General Agreement on Trade in Services, or GATS. And then it was recognised that it was a very controversial area to be talking about, so they introduced what they call positive listing. Only those particular sectors which you put forward for liberalisation would be included. What they've now started to do more is to use negative listing. And that means that if you don't say you want to exclude something, it's automatically in the list it or lose it idea. And what we're also seeing now is this hybrid version, so that for the market access, opening up your markets in the first place, they're using a positive listing. And then for the national treatment, which is how the different corporations will be treated once they're in the market, they're using a negative listing. That's what we're seeing, for example, in the bilateral trade deal between the EU and the US, and also in the trade and services agreement. Where are we in all of the negotiations? The multilateral negotiations at the World Trade Organization, which was the next round of GATS negotiations, they've stalled. And so a group of countries, 50 in total, have negotiated the Trade in Services Agreement, or TISA, and negotiations for that are ongoing. In addition, you've got the bilateral trade deals, like the one between the EU and the USA, TTIP, the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, which is still being negotiated now. And then you've got the EU-Canada deal, which is CETA, the Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, which the negotiations were concluded for in September 2014, and now is going through a process of ratification. So each of these take on the services negotiations to a new level, and each build on the last, so that you get more and more and more liberalisation from one agreement to the next. What about the annexes to CETA? CETA, which is the EU-Canada deal, is on a negative listing. And so the idea is unless you've listed something, you lose it for the future. You don't get the opportunity to take it back and to take it back into public hands, for example. There are two annexes in that deal. The first annex is relating to things you've already managed to exempt, so limitations you've already put in. Um, and it says that those will be preserved, but you won't be able to introduce any new reservations, any new limitations in those sectors. Annex 2 gives you much more freedom because it says that you will be able to introduce new reservations, new limitations, new rules in those sectors, even if you haven't been able to think about them up until now. So the key question then is, are public services included in these trade negotiations? Well, the first thing to say is we know what sectors are included. So, for example, in the TTIP negotiations or in TISA, we know that health, education, water, wastewater, rail, post, road transport, all of these sectors are included. In fact, the only sector which isn't included in TTIP, for example, is the audiovisual sector, because the French government said from the very start they would not allow that to be in there. What about the European Commission's arguments for why public services are not included? The European Commission says that there is a blanket exemption for all public services, which they trace back to GATS, the General Agreement on Trade and Services. And there's a particular clause in GATS, clause 1.3b, 
which says that any services which are supplied in the exercise of governmental authority are not included. But that's very, very narrowly defined to mean only services where there's, there's no competition with the private sector and where there's no commercial basis for their delivery. And we've heard in the past very clearly from trade negotiators that means most public services are not covered by that exemption. Particularly in Britain, we've heard that the NHS is not covered by that exemption. And what about the public utilities exemption? This public utilities exemption is another one which the European Commission introduced once they realised that the GATS original exemption didn't work. The public utilities exemption you can read on page 36 of the TTIP schedule, you can read it on page 38 of the TISA schedule, and it says that public utilities might still be subject to public monopolies or to exclusive rights granted to private operators. And again, the European Commission says that proves public services are safe. However, back in 2011, the European Commission had already written its own internal documents saying that that exemption is no longer strong enough to protect public services in Europe. So according to their own arguments, that's not a strong enough exemption to protect the public services that we need to protect from these trade agreements. And what about national limitations? Well, each member of the European Union gets the opportunity to write in their own national limitations where they say, for our particular country, we don't want to offer up this service sector or this subsector. And again, if you look at the schedules here, you can see things where, for example, the UK has a national limitation in which relates to ambulance services. So while they've said we're totally happy to open up all the rest of our hospital services to foreign competition, ambulance services are not part of that commitment. Talk to me about the threat from ISDS. Well, the ISDS mechanism, this investor state dispute settlement mechanism, which is such a feature of new trade agreements, including TTIP, including CETA, the EU-Canada one, that applies across the board. And so it would be perfectly possible for corporations which have been given access to a particular market to sue the government if the government starts taking back those markets into public hands or if the government introduces new rules which somehow infringe the right of these corporations to make profits in the future. And we've seen examples already, for example, in Slovakia, where Slovakia reversed a very unpopular health privatisation in the past. They were immediately sued by a Dutch company, Acmea, and the suit was found in favour of Acmea. They were granted 22 million euros in compensation just because the Slovakian government decided they didn't want to have that privatised health insurance system anymore. And where do people go to find out more? There's lots of really good resources which are available on the internet and which we're listing here so that people can go find out about them in their own time, read much more. There's some very complex legal descriptions of exactly what and what isn't included within trade and services. And there's more general material which is more for a lay audience. But the good news is that people have really put a lot of effort into explaining why it is we can't trust the politicians' assurances that public services are safe. They're not safe, everybody's completely right to be worried about them, and this is the chapter and verse which will explain why.